All right, good afternoon. Uh, this is room four. Um, this session is NFTs as Decentralized Intellectual Property. And our speaker today is Dr. Edward Lee, Professor of Law at Illinois Tech, Chicago Kent College of Law. Okay. Terrific, thank you so much. And thank you uh, to all who are attending. Uh, I'll be sharing my screen uh, in a second. Uh, and I also um, am happy to field uh, your questions at the end of the talk if there is time uh, remaining. Okay, so uh, I am sharing with you today uh, a paper that will be published in March with uh, the University of Illinois Law Review. It is probably the most controversial thing I've written in nearly 25 years of being an academic. And it is also uh, the paper that it has been the most widely read outside of the legal academy uh, with businesses, artists, and other individuals who have or already read a draft, a preprint draft of this article. Uh, so I was happy to be invited to the DuPont Summit to speak about my uh, theories. Okay, now before I get to my theory, uh, I thought, uh, I'd like to start out with a brief bit of history. And the 1920s it was a very volatile period, also post-pandemic uh, with the uh, flu of 1918. And uh, during this time, uh, there was a debate in legal academy uh, over what should be taught in law schools. What is the study of law meant to focus on. And a new school of thought had developed called legal realism. Uh, and under this view, uh, the study of law should be more than just the law on the books. It should look to what parties and entities do in practice. One of the chief proponents of this theory was Professor Carl Llewellyn of the Columbia Law School. And he engaged in a public debate with the Dean of Harvard Law School, Roscoe Pound, uh, who took a dip more traditional view of the study of law. Now, Llewellyn's view animated a, an important contribution that he made to United States law and United States society, uh, what is called the UCC or Uniform Commercial Code. Uh, it has been adopted in all 50 states, and no one sort of questions that this is the right approach to take for commercial practices. Now, what did uh, Llewellyn do with this new approach? Uh, he said, well, instead of focusing solely on formal contract law that are is contained in legal decisions of courts, uh, we shall look to what is happening in practice with respect to agreements among commercial entities and businesses and individuals. Uh, and instead of focusing solely on the literal text of the contracts, you know, the legalese contained in a written document, we should see how the parties are operating. Uh, under the agreement, what their prior course of dealing was, and also whether there is a so-called usage of trade in the industry, the industry may understand a certain term uh, to mean something different from the dictionary definition of the term. And uh, under this approach of the UCC, that would be perfectly uh, acceptable for a court to examine uh, the broader context of the industry. Okay, and as I said, this became highly influential. All 50 states have adopted it. No one really questions it today that this makes a lot of sense to go beyond just the law on the books and to examine what happens in practice. Perfect. Okay, now let's fast forward to the 2020s. Uh, I know I'm just jumping through time so quickly, uh, but this was also a very volatile period that we're still you know, experiencing also during a pandemic and also with great technological uh, changes. Uh, 
if we take the, a similar approach to what Carl Llewellyn did with respect to contract law and apply it to copyright law, I think we will learn something much greater than just examining the formal law of copyright. You know, Congress enacts a statute, the Copyright Act of 1976, uh, courts interpret it, those establish precedents. That's terrific. I teach my students uh, really focusing on this a lot. But in my research, in terms of the new technology of NFTs or non-fungible tokens, I think there's something far different than what is the formal law of copyright in uh, on the book, so to speak. So if we look at the realities of commercial practices using the new technology of NFTs, we will find that there is a rearrangement of rights uh, under copyright to make it more flexible for the internet and the digital context, and also more sustainable for individual creators and artists. Okay. So my article, my main thesis is that NFTs are operating as a form of decentralized intellectual property, uh, taking the formal law of copyright uh, and taking the exclusive rights under copyright and making it more efficient and flexible for the digital context. Okay, now before getting into NFTs and I'll give a brief definition of what an NFT is and how it operates. Just to quickly mention that there is a earlier movement that is also still ongoing for decentralized finance and the most, uh, I think, common example of decentralized finance is the establishment of cryptocurrency. Now, cryptocurrency is incredibly controversial. Uh, some people uh, don't like it. A lot of people uh, are very enthusiastic about this development. Um, for our purposes, we don't need to decide whether we like it or not. I, I think what's more important is understanding the transformation that those who are you know, developing cryptocurrency are trying to do. What they're trying to do is establish a financial system that is not under a centralized control of, let's say, the Federal Reserve, which you know, has the power to set monetary policy of the United States and raise interest rates, which has created you know, quite a, a lot of media attention over the past year. Instead of that, the decentralized financial system is one that is not controlled by a central institution saying like, okay, well, now we will limit the amount of cryptocurrency to X amount or you know, anything with interest rates. Uh, it is simply uh, decentralized. Okay. So that's, I, I think, all you need to take away from this parallel example. Uh, now, let's focus in on decentralized intellectual property uh, and what that means and how it operates. Uh, it is a similar kind of effort to create a de decentralized system, very, you know, loosely very uh, system uh, from something that was centralized uh, traditionally. So, as I said before, Congress enacts a copyright act. The Copyright Office sits within the Library of Congress and uh, it establishes the policies related to copyright, largely dealing with copyright industries, movie industry, music industry, publishing industry. Uh, so the, the major intermediaries, uh, which drive a lot of economic activity for the United States. Uh, the parallel is the use of NFTs is decentralized on blockchain. And there are marketplaces that are sort of like the intermediaries, uh, but they don't control uh, who can 
sell an NFT. Uh, any artist uh, that has you know access to inter the internet can potentially develop and sell uh, her or his NFT. Uh, okay, so that is the sort of thrust of this movement to NFTs. Um, now, let me just give you a brief uh, definition or explanation of what an NFT is. And if I achieve anything in this today's talk, at least by the time this talk is over, you'll be able to tell your friends, oh, I, now I know what an NFT is. Um, uh, it's not, uh, I think, um, that difficult to understand once you uh, uh, dissect the parts of it. An NFT is a computer program. Okay, it's great. That's very uh, understandable. Uh, it's called a smart contract. It's recorded on blockchain, which blockchain is a decentralized network that acts as a public record. So that's the benefit of blockchain. Anybody can look up a transaction on blockchain. Okay, it's a sort of permanent record. Now for the smart contracts creating an NFT, non-fungible token, each one has a unique identifier. It's similar to every passport has a unique number. It would make no sense to have more than one passport have the same number because that would then uh, you know, create problems and confusion on who is rightfully the person <laughs> that is identified in the passport by that number. Okay, same idea with an NFT, okay? Uh, so that's how it operates first. Now, if that's all that did, it'd be hard to understand, well, what's the point of this? Like, how do we know what it does or what value it adds? Uh, as a computer program, you then can make it identify anything else that you want it to. Uh, now, the most common examples have been in the art world, where artists have now used NFTs and they identify a piece of art, often it's digital, and I've created this uh, simple face, uh, Blondie. Uh, my artwork is embodied in a copy, a JPEG, the file stored in my PowerPoint, also could be store, uh, stored online. Uh, and now I have directed my program to identify that uh, digital file. But my NFT, the token, is not the same as the digital file. It is this complex arrangement where my token, my computer program is stored on blockchain and it points to my artwork. And then what I do as the creator, I attach a copyright or content license, a contract. You know, going back to Carl Llewellyn, I've attached a contract to the sale of my NFT that I now grant rights to whoever buys my NFT to use my artwork. And this ultimately creates virtual ownership over the token as well as associated digital file. So that's the simple uh, sort of uh, breakdown of what an NFT does with respect to artworks. Uh, and why it's become attractive, especially for digital art. Now, my paper explains how these NFTs with their licenses are being used in far different ways than how copyright licenses were used in the 20th century businesses. Uh, okay, so the first example is Artists have elected to receive a royalty for every resale of their NFT. So uh, they sell it to one person, that person sells it to somebody else and so forth. Um, if the value of the NFT grows, let's say it was first sold for $100, but buyer number three sold it for $1 million. What a royalty does is give a small percentage of the sale of $1 million, let's say 5%, to the artist who created the artwork. Uh, 
And uh, in one year, over $1.5 billion in royalties have been collected, distributed to artists, something in the United States they never had before, even though uh, 80 other countries have a resale royalty right under copyright law. Uh, okay, and this is the single biggest reason why artists love NFTs, is it finally gives them some form of financial sustainability. So Tyler Hobbs is a famous artist in this area, says single largest positive shift. Claire Silver, single most impactful change, generational transformation, and it's fair. Fuocious, another prominent artist uh, said, royalties were the reason the art community flocked to NFTs in the first place. A new democratization of art in a new world where artists finally found a way to get paid for their works on an ongoing basis. So you get a sense of how important this is to artists to have some royalty so that on, on an ongoing basis, they might receive uh, income from the sale of their artworks. Okay. Uh, another practice that is happening in this area involving NFTs is that the creators are granting rights that are far more uh, valuable uh, to the buyers of their NFTs. The traditional way of the 20th, 20th century is the copyright owner retains all rights, all rights reserved, basically means no trespass. Uh, the top 25 projects, I have another study coming out. The top 25 projects in NFTs, the majority, 64% of the projects, grant commercial rights to the buyers of their NFTs. So just imagine if Walt Disney Company granted commercial rights to anybody who bought a Mickey Mouse merchandise. And the buyer of a Mickey Mouse merchandise could monetize it, could make a movie with Mickey Mouse. I mean, that sounds far-fetched. Will never happen, right? Will never happen, all rights reserved. The 21st century using NFTs, these primarily, their, their NFT creators are startup companies, you know, kind of innovative startup companies. They're granting the commercialization rights to use the artworks, uh, however the buyer sees fit. Uh, so that's a dramatic kind of innovation in use. Um, okay, so moving right along, um, uh, another change in practice is that uh, NFT projects, uh, especially the most successful ones, tend to be more permissive in allowing unauthorized uses of their artwork. Um, so what we would consider to be piracy in a 20th century kind of framework or uh, frame of mind uh, is considered to be creativity and remix of the artwork. Uh, so here's an example. The CryptoPunks are probably the pinnacle of NFT projects. Uh, they are considered the Mona Lisas of NFTs. The highest sale for one CryptoPunk is $23 million. Um, and that's after all of these CryptoPunks NFTs were given away for free. Um, unfortunately, I, I was not one of the lucky ones uh, to um, get one of the free versions. Uh, now, as being one of the most successful projects, uh, it has spawned a lot of copycat projects or derivative versions or remix versions and just this month, there's another one. It's called Ordinal Punks, the one on the right. Um, so you could see like this is not licensed. It's not authorized by the copyright owners, but it's still allowed with no threat of a lawsuit. Uh, and somebody is keeping a track of all of the uses of CryptoPunks artwork in derivative projects that are not licensed. It's close to 200 projects that are unauthorized or unlicensed. 
So just to go back to my example of Disney, just imagine there are 200 derivative versions of Mickey Mouse that uh, are not authorized by Disney. Again, that would never happen. Uh, Disney is known for uh, policing its IP pretty aggressively. Uh, so in the 21st century, with these new NFT projects, they have taken a different approach, a more permissive approach to uh, uses of their artwork. Uh, and then the fourth example of a practice, commercial practice um, on the ground that is not you know, captured in the Copyright Act is that there are many daily public discussions about how copyright should be applied to digital artwork. Uh, so I, I admit one of the concerns we should have is, well, in this decentralized system, isn't this bypassing Congress? You know, Congress is the representative of the people and it has the power under the constitution to develop uh, copyright law. Uh, that is uh, certainly true, but the development of NFTs does not displace uh, Congress or displace the traditional copyright system, it has created a rearranged kind of ordering, private ordering, uh, that coexists with our traditional system. Uh, so I'm not going to focus uh, too um, much in depth in these tweets, but uh, it just shows there are there's daily discussion by you know lay people, not lawyers talking about different issues with respect to copyright and digital artwork. Uh, this one just was from February 7th. Just to show you, uh, this is happening on Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, uh, and Discord. Um, okay, another way in which um, I, I think is important to emphasize uh, a decentralized IP system is perfectly consistent with having uh, Congress given the power to enact copyright law is that the businesses who are engaged with NFTs, as well as researchers like myself, you know, who study it, can engage in a dialogue with Congress and the Copyright Office about these new developments that seem to help individual authors and artists. You know, something certainly that the copyright clause of the constitution wants to help in, a, in order to promote progress in the United States. So at the request of two senators, the Copyright Office and the Patent and Trademark Office held roundtables about what's happening with NFTs. I think this is great. Um, and I was lucky to be invited to be a speaker at one of the roundtables for copyright law. Uh, I also submitted this comment uh, to inform the Copyright Office of what I have researched and found as these some of these practices that have developed uh, to engage in this dialogue with uh, the Copyright Office, uh, which is acting at the instruction or request of Congress. So there again is another example of ways in which uh, a decentralized IP system can coexist with um, our centralized IP system. Uh, and then um, I'm almost uh, at the end of my talk and I'll open it up if there are any questions. Uh, I did wanna mention today's talk is there is a version of this paper online um, Feel free, my email is available for those attendees who signed up. Uh, I'm also, you can find me online. Uh, I teach at Chicago Cannon College of Law. Um, this paper is the paper that I've just summarized for you today. Uh, I'm also happy to announce that at the end of March, uh, I have a book coming out from Harper Business. Uh, it is also available for pre-ordering. Uh, I go through uh, many examples of different artists and businesses uh, and how they're using NFTs in this kind of decentralized IP manner. Uh, so it, it may be more accessible to the average layperson 
then maybe my law review article is much more the audience uh, for legal academics and lawyers. Uh, okay, so let me stop and see if there are any uh, questions at all. No. Okay, let me check for you. Okay. Okay, let's see any quick Q and A. Uh, any questions in the room? You have a question? Okay. Oh. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, just a, a question from uh, more at the beginning of your talk uh, is that uh, you mentioned that uh, we have copyright law in the books, and um, you were making the suggestion that this commercial practice should now establish new cap copyright law that would, what I thought I heard, subvert the existing copyright law. So I was wondering if you could just deconflict that for me. Sure, I mean, that's an excellent question. I guess the only thing I would change is to not subvert uh, the copyright law, but to uh, adapt it or supplement it for specific uses by a particular artist. And, this is something, you know, it's it's called private ordering, and it's something that our Copyright Act actually expects because it it grants the copyright owner the ability to divide up its rights in contracts however it sees fit. Um, and the Copyright Office, in a study in 2013, also came out and supported the possible adoption of voluntary agreements to have individual artists receive resale royalties. Uh, uh, Maria Palente was the Register of Copyrights at the time, and uh, she pointed to five different examples where art uh, galleries were already doing this before NFTs. Uh, so I, I think that it's not a, subversion, it is a tailoring of the copyright exclusive rights to kind of better fit the digital um, context of online um, digital artworks. Uh, and it also, you know, solves one problem that uh, maybe, uh, you know, the Copyright Office uh, had not had a chance to really grapple with. Um, Digital artists face the problem, they, they had a hard time selling digital art because it there's no one copy, right? There's no Picasso painting in one canvas. Every copy in a digital context could be uh, infinitely reproduced with you know, nearly perfect fidelity, like not much loss of resolution. What the NFT solved was how do you create a unique original for digital art? And they did so by this token. You know, it's like, okay, now I have a token and only one person gets the token. Um, so that is a technological innovation that was uh, developed that, uh, you know, it, it's fairly common. Uh, the law has a hard time keeping pace with the technology. And this is one instance of that phenomenon. Uh, you know, digital art was just not being um, valued, um, but now it is, as, as I said, like some of these works are selling for over $20 million. I mean, the highest work so far is $69 million for Beeple's every days. That's a purely digital work, uh, but it, it commanded that much value. But thank you for the question. I think it's an excellent question. And uh, as I, uh, try to uh, explain, we do need to be sensitive about ensuring, you know, Congress has the constitutional power to uh, set, establish copyright law. Uh, but I think there's enough room to develop uh, this decentralized IP uh, system. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Lee. Thank you to our attendees. We are just about out of time. And um, we're just going to conclude our session now. Okay. Thank you so much. Have, have a wonderful evening.